welcome Kimber Lockhart. All right. Well, hello, Kansas City. I am so excited to be back in the Midwest. Um, a very special shout out to Maxine. I am just so inspired and impressed by what they're doing through Zadie. And if you're ever giving away like a wardrobe redesign, if you can kind of like loop me in, that would be fantastic. I want to say a huge thank you to all of the conference organizers, the sponsors, the other speakers, and each and every one of you guys for braving the rain and coming on out today. Um, it's all about putting your presence in what you care about. I also want to say a huge thank you, especially to Caleb for making this perhaps the best organized conference experience I've ever had. Now you guys are two of my favorite groups of people, Midwesterners and entrepreneurs all in the same place. I'm originally from Ames, Iowa, and just back in July, I um, married an entrepreneur from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so uh, definitely very, very excited to see you here today. What we're gonna talk about today is leadership. All right, well, we're gonna talk about how the concept of authentic leadership is about how it's not, it's not that there's one right way to be a leader. And when you're someone like me, and you've been a leader throughout your life, and you're not the kind of person who looks like a person who would be a leader, you learn that the types of strategies you use as a leader are very different. So what I'm gonna do today is share the story of how I learned what kind of leadership and style works for me. You're gonna hear about good times, you're gonna hear about bad times, and hopefully share the inspiration and guidance for you as you set out to find what your own um, authentic leadership style is, is. So this is actually me um, in the boss hat. And while leadership is about more than being the boss, I think this gives you a little clue into uh, uh, into the future for that little girl. The story really starts, though, um, about 12 years later. As a ninth grader, I'm shy, I'm introverted, I'm good at getting A's, the teachers like me, I don't get in fights with my parents for really any reason other than my messy room. I have a little bit of a lisp. I get really scared speaking in front of crowds. I am hardly the profile of an entrepreneur, an outgoing, self-assured, independent rebel. Fortunately for my career, that is not a prerequisite for being an entrepreneurial leader. And that leads me to the first lesson of leading authentically. Anyone can lead. The story starts with knitting. I was a knitter when I was a kid. Who here has ever tried to knit? Okay, so the deal is it's creative, but it's a little bit boring and repetitive. But something about it really, really appealed to me. One day, um, you know, within the span of a couple of days, I had two things happen to me in the world of knitting. The first is that I found a pattern for a hat. And the intention of the hat was to be donated to a cancer center to go to patients undergoing chemotherapy um, when life was kind of at its roughest. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe I'll make one of those one day. Within the same week, a bunch of boys from my high school class learned how to crochet. First of all, what? Secondly, they got pretty good. And the gears started turning. And I started thinking, what if it's not just about me making a hat, but I can get these boys to also make a hat, and then maybe I can mobilize my community to all make hats, and the city of Des Moines, Iowa will never be out of hats for chemotherapy patients in need. Now, how was I gonna make that happen? These are the leaders I knew at the time. The guy on the left-hand corner of the screen is my high school principal. You guys might not recognize him. And 
this is me. And we didn't really have a lot in common, these leaders and me. So I said, well, this isn't very useful. And I just kind of set out and did things my own way, step by step. And it turns out the things that we didn't have in common were the things that made me most effective. Being a little bit nervous when I walked into those community centers to ask for help was exactly what caused people to respond generously. I didn't have authority, not even close, so I had to rely on my influence and build connections through influence. I ask all the stupid questions and people were more than happy to help. I learned what worked and I learned what didn't, and while the chemotherapy cap drive of my high school career was hardly earth shattering. It made me fall in love with entrepreneurship and how with one idea, with one connecting of the dots, I could change someone's world. And in fact, it was a few years later um, when I was in a class on entrepreneurship at Stanford that I learned my next big lesson on authentic leadership. That lesson is that you can't follow anyone else. So the class I was in is called the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders Lecture Series. It's a student-organized lecture series where they bring in um, awesome entrepreneurs, business leaders, community members. In fact, if you have a good time today, I would highly recommend downloading the podcast. I was organizing this series at the time, and I remember that one of my key frustrations is that the people that came in all had such different and times conflicting advice. So up there is uh, Ron Conway. Uh, he's a prominent angel investor. He would come in and say, you need to do your company exactly like this or I will not invest. Reid Hoffman came in a couple weeks later, founder of LinkedIn, and he said, you know, this particular way of running your startup is exactly the way you need to do it. And then uh, Mir Imran, who has a very different approach from everybody else, uh, came in and spoke to us and said, oh, no problem, just run six companies at a time, you're good. And so this is me at the time, and I'm a little bit confused. Which of these is right, and how does it work? Well, one thing that became clear after listening to person after person after person is that a lot of different approaches work. And if these guys are in any indication, work really, really well. The concrete example of that right now is who knows who the CEO of Apple was in 2012? Seriously? And who knows who the CEO of 3M was in 2012? Radio silence. Excellent. Both of these companies are great companies, but clearly they take very, very different approaches. So I took what made sense from these various leaders. And I brought it together, tried it on for size, and kept what felt real to me. This is important because I was going to need it. My junior year, the entrepreneurial bug bit. And there's two ways that a lot of people get started starting a company. You either find a need that you care about passionately, and you realize that you're the only person who can solve this, or you take the approach I said and say, wow, this entrepreneurial life sounds awesome. Let's get a group of people that I love together, and we'll spend some time thinking of what those issues are in our lives that we can solve. Now, we took that latter approach, and then we spent some time thinking. And uh, you know, we came up with uh, this issue of getting feedback on your documents. So who's ever merged a bunch of tracked change documents? Yeah, it's really terrible. You never want to do it. Now, this was in 2008. And one of the things that was happening in the world in 2008 is the technology to be able to view documents in your browser was getting better and better. In fact, it was getting to a point where it was possible to build a robust system um, where you could leave feedback all in the same place and never have this merging problem ever happen again. So my friends and I built it. This was our junior year of college. Our senior year of college, spring, spring quarter, we were working full time, serving customers, building the product, et cetera, and also finishing school. On top of it, I'd spent all my money on college. If I was going to do this, I was going to need some sort of source of capital. So I talked my co-founders into going out to the venture market in 
early 2008. We got lucky, we raised some seed capital from uh, DFJ and we invested back into the business. We built a team of about seven people over the course of the next two years to build this product and take it to market and it was one of the most exciting experiences of my whole life. Enter 2009, who remembers what happened in uh, late 2008, early 2009? Anybody here trying to fundraise in 2009? Let me just tell you, wasn't a lot of fun. There was money out there, but there wasn't much. So we had this company and we'd achieved every goal we set aside with this company. We had customers and revenue. We weren't profitable yet. But we had everything that we'd agreed upon were the criterion for success. Now when we went out to the market and the market was dried up, um, it caused my co-founders and I to get together and say, uh-oh. What are we gonna do? We're employing these people. And we said, well, how could we be profitable tomorrow? And this is actually an exercise I encourage frequently. Even if you are profitable, how can we be five times as profitable tomorrow? How can we hit a major disruption in our business? And we came up with a strategy that, that worked. We said, hey, we've got this technology. The technology is actually more interesting than the product that relies on it. We can take it out and license it to a bunch of uh, these document management companies that really want to be able to provide their users a visualization of the document as they're using the service. Turns out one of those companies was called Box. Um, Box was a, about a 50-person startup document management company at that time. And Box came in, and they came in interested in being a little bit tighter partners than we were originally thinking. In fact, they came to us, and their CEO, who was uh, uh, actually very young, they're only a couple years older than we are, were at Encreo at the time, comes to us and says, hey, we'd like to buy you. We're like, uh, that wasn't part of the plan, but maybe. Um, and we spent some time with that team, and one of the things we discovered is not only is the technology a really, really excellent fit, but the teams were great fits, too. So. We were able to actually make the sale to Box. And when I joined Box, um, Box, like I said, was about 40 people. Uh, and I joined at just the right inflection point for them to go from 40 people up to about 1,000 people in three years. Part of that kind of growth is that you need leaders who are capable of leading a team of five or a team of 50, or a team of 100, or 150, within weeks of each other. And so being able to grow as a leader becomes so incredibly important. This is where I learned lesson four, learn through experiments. When I first became a software leader, I came off of Encreo, where it was just this like seven person, we were all in one room, we had a whiteboard, maybe occasionally I'd have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, into an engineering organization where I needed to be a real professional mature leader. And the people that I saw doing this job were awesome, but they also weren't really like me. They had 10, 15 years of seniority that gave them a level of credibility that I didn't have. And I was managing all of these fantastic, smart, brilliant software engineers. So clearly, there is going to be, have to be something about my approach that was unique. So what did I do? Well, at Box, I learned how to lead through experimentation. And this is maybe the best advice I've gotten in my entire career about how to be a leader. So if you only listen for one part, this is where you start. This was about generating a huge pool of potential ideas of what might work for you. I did this through reading. You can do this through listening to talks, through talking to mentors. However you want to find the input data, you can find it then running a series of crafted, intentional experiments. So what I would do is I'd sit down and I'd think of some aspect of leadership that, I wanted, that I'd heard was a good idea that I wanted to try out to see how well it worked for me. Let's use an example. Um, when delivering someone negative feedback, first have a dialogue with them about why whatever it was was happening. 
okay, sounds like a good idea. I might be able to do that. Maybe it'd lower my credibility when I deliver the new negative feedback, but there it is. So the important part here is you write it down. You're intentional. You define an experiment. So I defined an experiment, find some success criteria. And I took about two to three weeks and I tried this out. How did it work? Did it work for me? What were the responses like? Now, we weren't talking a meaningful data size, but it was certainly enough to start to get some feedback about how this process worked. So if you ever have to learn how to do something, especially with other people that you don't know how to do right now, I would so very much recommend taking a rigorous scientific experimental approach. After about four years at Box, um, it was time for me to tap into what was authentic about me and move on to a cause that I deeply cared about. Um, one of the things that I think is very broken in our world right now is healthcare, especially primary healthcare, especially that very first relationship with your doctor and how preventative health works in that. And uh, so I, I decided to make the move over to one medical group. Now, there's not a one medical group in Kansas City, so give me just a little bit of time to tell you about what one medical group is. One medical group is a startup healthcare practice, primary care, um, that's currently available in about six cities across the US. So San Francisco, LA, Chicago, New York, Boston, and DC. We're growing extremely rapidly, so if you're not based in Chicago, we'll be coming your way soon. What's unique about One Medical is that we want to provide a really easy, painless relationship, high quality relationship with your doctor. So you can get things like uh, same day visits, and then we build technology that helps you build that relationship even when you're not in the office. Uh, so this is actually what one of our offices look like. Now, I was hired to come in and help scale the technology efforts of One Medical. How can we get, um, how can we reach out to patients more? How can we help them be accountable and responsible for their own health in a very meaningful way? What's interesting about this is we're up against a lot. There's huge, huge players in healthcare, and One Medical is up and coming, but we're still pretty small. So what that requires of the company and of each individual in that company is that we're able to balance this humility of this is a big industry that we need to make sure that we understand. And especially me coming in as a leader without healthcare background. There's a huge amount of humility in how I have to go through my job every single day. But at the same time, there's confidence because so many things are the same. People are the same. Software is the same, problems are the same. And so we end up having to balance this, uh, this humility with this confidence as, 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 as leaders we move into new industries. So what I want to leave you with today is just thinking through your own life and thinking about where you are, what you've learned. Anyone can lead. You can't follow anybody else. You're empowered to go out and make change even if you're not the most qualified person. You can learn how to do it through defined experimentation. And no matter what you do, whatever you learn, um, the spirit of entrepreneurship is approaching a new situation with humility and confidence. You can make a difference. So thank you very much uh, for your time today. Um, and I think we may have a little time for questions. Yeah.